Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for having me. My name is James Spiro and I'm a journalist and editor at CTEC and I'm, it's a pleasure to be here at AI Week um, on day one for the AI and automotive session. So as long as there has been AI and automotives, there has been a conversation about the role it'll play in, in, in the streets and in the vehicles. And it's a delight now to introduce Irad Bengal, the professor in the engineering faculty and head of Lambda at Tel Aviv University. Now, uh, Irad Bengal is the head of the laboratory of AI business and data analytics uh, and the engineering faculty in Tel Aviv University. And it's a delight to hear from him about using AI tools for smart transportation analytics. Uh, thank you very much. So until that happens, um, we're just going to tell you a bit more about the conference itself. So the conference explores a variety of different forms of AI, not just transportation. We heard from natural language processing. Um, there are a variety of areas such as ethics and other areas. And um, over the three-day event, we're going to be hearing from experts from in academia and business and entrepreneurs and they will share their insights as to how to best kind of combat the, uh, the next era into the, uh, the things that we're hearing and discussing today and the week, uh, weeks we go on. Anyway, enough about me. I can see that Arad has joined, ready to discuss. Arad Bengal, thank you very much. Um, the, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, happy to be here. It's, I think, the... Uh, fifth year that I participating and it becomes better and better each time. I'll share my uh, presentation. Let me know if uh, you see that. One sec. Let me just see. Okay, you should see it. Uh, you should see it now. On a presentation mode. Yes, that looks great. Thank you, Arad. Okay, so uh, I will be talking about uh, smart transportation application based on AI. Uh, particularly, I will talk about two uh, research projects uh, that were conducted with uh, strong collaboration with the Shlomo Schmelzer uh, Institute for Smart Transportation that supports us also with. Uh, data and uh, business insight. They are the largest uh, leasing uh, car leasing company in Israel. And uh, uh, the two students that will be talking in the session, Moran and uh, Echen, uh, uh, I will show their, their work. And, and another speaker is Yuval that was part of our lab. And uh, uh, this lab is usually collaborating with the industry in uh, tackling relevant problems uh, and uh, uh, at the same time supporting students in their master and PhD thesis. So uh, the first work of uh, Moran will be on a smart based trajectory prediction framework. Uh, the main goal of this research is to predict vehicle a uh, complete trajectory, and uh, not only the next location, which is usually what uh, we find in the industry, and to use both uh, spatio-temporal features uh, on uh, real time, sorry for the typo, uh, while applying uh, what we call a dynamic time wrapping, an approximation version of it for the first time. And the idea or the motivation to uh, to have such an, uh, an ability is to uh, be able uh, to uh, support a bunch of models and application in smart cities and smart transportation. For example, cooperative transportation of uh, people or last mile delivery of uh, supply chain. If you know where the vehicle is uh, going to move, you can, uh, you know, you can uh, actually use this information to offer location-based advertising and to. Uh, uh, suggest the driver to uh, take someone or to take some uh, small um, 
uh, deliver it to, uh, to the place uh, nearby and so on. And of course, also parking applications are relevant. So these are the application. I don't have time to go over the literature, but uh, no one was trying to actually predict the whole trajectory on real time, which is uh, the focus of this thesis. And the main idea of the proposed method is to extract trips and cluster trajectory. This is the main challenge. I will be talking about it a little more. And then do some feature engineering and train and uh, you know, uh, long short term uh, memory, a deep network model such that if you uh, provide um, trips of the vehicle, you can actually predict where it will go. I see that Yuval was joining, hi Yuval. And uh, uh, the idea was uh, to use what we call dynamic time wrapping uh, to, uh, to answer those challenges. I will, I will be talking about it in a moment. So again, the idea is, as you see in the up uh, right picture here, is uh, to have all those rides, all those rides cluster into specific uh, um, trajectories. And the problem is that, uh, you know, people are moving sometime from the same location and the same, uh, um, um, on the same destination on different routes, or they share the same route, though they are actually not sharing the same destination. So it's kind of uh, tricky to find out those routes and to, to be able to predict out of them. And the first thing that uh, one needs to know, one needs to uh, uh, solve is how to measure distance between different routes. And uh, traditionally people were using and many times for those uh, patterns, some kind of uh, uh, Euclidean distance measure. The problem with the, this measure is that uh, you need to have an equal length. And uh, even if you take, uh, you know, um, the different version of it, uh, there are certain challenges that uh, are not relevant in, in when you are consider uh, those trajectory similarity on a real uh, database. And what we used, and we were not the first one, is to use dynamic time wrapping. Dynamic time wrapping was actually used in speech recognition to match words spoken in different speeds and sometimes in different parts of the sentences. The nice thing about those uh, uh, dynamic time wrapping is that uh, you can actually have two different paths. Doesn't matter if these are words or location on the map. Uh, that are of different sizes, so different sentences with different sizes. And you can actually, you compute a, a pairwise distance between all the points in each path, and then you select the minimal one. So this is how it looks. You have all the option between uh, all the points from the blue path and the points in the red path. And eventually you find the shortest uh, distance between them and, and you accumulate it to the distance of uh, 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 the uh, the distance be between these two uh, two paths. Now the problem is that uh, since you are computing a pairwise distance between the two routes, uh, we are talking about the computational complexity of uh, you know a quadratic uh, time computational complexity, which when you talk about routes of you know uh, half an hour one hour where you have a sampling rate of 50 seconds it's a huge matrix and you can actually uh, cannot solve it on real time which was the objective of this research so what uh, moran was using is a, a linear time variant of this quadratic time uh, dtw uh, algorithm that uh, uh, actually find this minimum distance wrap by uh, moving from a lower resolution and then refining the wraps. We don't have time to go over it, but uh, it is much more simpler uh, to calculate this distance. And once you have this distance, you can actually apply different clustering mechanism on the on the data. And uh, here we use dbscan, one of the you know conventional density based clustering algorithm. Uh, to join those different trajectories to clusters uh, of, uh, of, uh, of those users. And uh, then based on those clusters, uh, we could actually 
uh, find a soft classification mapping. So if you have different trajectories in different days, so you see a distance for the day and you have seven days a week, and in each uh, day you have, uh, you know, 24 hours. So at each time and each day and each hour, you have uh, this model trained uh, using those clusters and you can actually find the probability that it belongs to each cluster. And this is what we show here as a probability of uh, that route belonging to cluster K at a certain day and at a certain uh, hour. And of course, it takes into account not only uh, the route clusters, but the time, the usual time that uh, uh, those users are uh, following those routes, uh, usual times and usual days that they are following those routes, and it learns it. Uh, uh, it learns it by applying, as I mentioned, the long short term memory uh, recurrent uh, neural networks uh, that was found to be uh, very efficient. And it, it is capable of uh, uh, learning and, and remembering these long sequences, sometime over you know, 30 or 40 or even an hour, and associate them with the right cluster, and then using that cluster for the prediction of the, of the route uh, at real time. So we got some 200 vehicle uh, data uh, that are, were actually uh, collected through uh, a year, 2018, uh, which means 32.2 million uh, data points uh, based on uh, GPS data. And uh, uh, the, as I mentioned before, the average distance of these two samples were uh, uh, 163 meters or the, you know, the sample rate was around uh, one sample per 15.6 seconds. So a lot of data and we were able uh, actually, what uh, we show here are different models. Uh, our model, the one that is based on the LSTM with both uh, spatial and temporal information, was able to perform uh, the best. Uh, and uh, what, what you can see here, this is the resolution that we use. So if we want uh, um, a resolution of 300 meters, uh, we can actually uh, predict 50% of those routes if we are willing to uh, sacrifice the resolution to uh, one kilometer we can actually predict almost 90 percent of those of those uh, uh, um, routes of those trips and uh, um, uh, we can predict it quite accurately with uh, you know uh, um, an accuracy rate of 80 between 71 to 83 percent again depending on the resolution and for that we only use uh, you know between 10 to 20% of the data. So this is actually, um, um, those are parameters that uh, can be used uh, in real time uh, to support all these applications that I uh, mentioned before. And it looks like that, what you see here is a beginning of a route. You, the vehicle was moving to a, a place where suddenly it seems that it will change the route, but right after you saw those uh, jump, right after, it's very clear that uh, it belongs to a route that is uh, uh, that can be defined uh, very clearly. So uh, these are the, uh, um, these are, this is one of those applications that we see. And what you see here on the left side is all those possible routes uh, at a certain point of that vehicle that eventually uh, you can uh, uh, follow quite many of them, but as time goes on, you are focused on run route and you can actually predict it in real time. So this is uh, one application. Uh, and again, I want to thank the Schmelzer Institute for supporting us with the insight and the data. And another uh, work was uh, done by uh, Hen Bengal, uh, Ken was trying to uh, predict uh, the trip driver. Uh, certainly, from from uh, you know uh, leasing company, when uh, when you have a fleet of vehicle, when uh, in some vehicles there are more than one driver, 
Sometimes you want to be able to identify the driver, specifically those, uh, you know, uh, short-term leasing uh, cars uh, that you want to be able to identify the driver, even if uh, this driver uses, uh, you know, a different ID to uh, enter the vehicle. So this is the motivation. And uh, you want to do it ad hoc on the first time that it happens while using only GPS uh, features. So only uh, features that are collected by the car and transmitted and are not anything related to uh, either the phone of the user or any internal sensor, like sensors like camera in the vehicle itself. And uh, when I talk about GPS feature, Ken was able to derive around 300 different features based on this GPS data. So it's a lot of uh, different features based on those GPS data, including, you know, uh, uh, change of routes, uh, acceleration, acceleration while, while the vehicle is uh, 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 turning and so on. And it was using active learning uh, and what we call route-based scaling. I will talk about it. This is part of the challenge that uh, he had to uh, solve in order to be able uh, to predict the driver. And again, some application examples are, of course, personalized insurance. You know, if you, if you drive differently, you should pay differently. Uh, today, most of those insurance are based on the age and the history of the driver, but not on the actual feature of the driving uh, uh, behavior of that uh, particular driver. You want to uh, uh, identify the drivers when you have a share, shared vehicle. I talked about it before. And even, you know, application like you want to identify anomalies, uh, for example, changing the driver behavior. So uh, uh, you are going to a bar and you want to get an indication to your phone that you are driving in a different way. Or maybe you want uh, that your uh, son that just got uh, his uh, license will get this indication that he should uh, be aware that he's driving in a different way. So these are just a few examples of those applications. Again, I won't go to the literature, but um, um, I will go back to it when we compare the results uh, based on some quite recent paper that were trying to solve the same, uh, the same type of uh, challenge. So, Ken was applying a, an active learning scheme. So uh, you actually continuous, uh, continuously uh, learning the behavior of the driver by using those 300 features uh, in, a, in a scheme known as active learning, uh, exploration, exploitation uh, scheme. And um, uh, what we did uh, as a third step and as an example is to take Two drivers, which I know very good. Uh, one is uh, my wife, Hilly, and the second was myself. Uh, we share uh, the same car. And uh, uh, the thing was that uh, not only that we share the same car, but uh, we share almost the same route. So uh, for those that are uh, in Tel Aviv, I teach in Tel Aviv University. Uh, my wife teaches in Afeka College. It's about half a kilometer distance one from it, it, another. And we are using the same, uh, you know, roads to uh, 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 from home to, to our work. Uh, so it's kind of tricky to separate uh, such drivers one from the other. And we could see it very clearly. What you see on the right side is this, uh, um, this is a PCA of those uh, 300 features. And you see that uh, those reds and, and, and blue points of uh, my wife and myself are quite, uh, yeah, they are uh, overlapping. It's very hard to distinguish between them. And what you see is what, that when you move to longer distance, you can, uh, you can actually separate the behavior much better. And actually, when you look on all the drivers, ignoring, uh, ignoring, sorry, all, all the all the uh, driving, ignoring the drivers, you see that each uh, trip has its own feature. So these are out of town trips, these are in town trips, and these are long distance trips. So uh, there is a strong bias that 
uh, actually affect our ability to distinguish between the drivers because actually the uh, the road itself dictates some of those uh, uh, driving behaviors. So if you are uh, if you are in uh, oops, I think that uh, I moved from. Uh, do you see my screen? Yeah, I assume yes. So if you are ignoring the fact that uh, each road has its own uh, characteristic, it's very hard to distinguish between the drivers. And what we did is to actually, uh, or Hen did, was to actually uh, normalize each route by the average driving behavior along that route. So you have uh, different routes and you have the information of all the drivers uh, that uh, we have their information using that route. And you use this uh, background information to normalize uh, the behavior of each driver. So it's no longer me against my wife, but it's me against the background and my, my wife against the background. And then it provides us a much better way to, uh, to separate it. And once we do it, we can use different models. We can use random force, we can use uh, boosting. And uh, what you see here is uh, one of many uh, output. Uh, this is a truth matrix separating uh, uh, myself and, and my, my wife uh, driving uh, uh, over uh, 326 drives where we reach an accuracy of uh, more than 91% with uh, again an 85% precision and a recall of 82%. So quite good results that were uh, very challenging to achieve in the beginning before the Hen found this way to normalize those uh, driving behavior by the background of, of the roads. So I stop here and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, and uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Arad. That was uh, very informative. We, we got a question in from the audience as you were talking, not so much a question, but just a kind of clarification as to how you make GT vector for DTW from different trajectories and different lengths. Um, I'm sure maybe that makes more sense to you than it does to me. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I suggest, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's quite uh, technical, but uh, what I suggest is uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the person that asked it will send me an email and we will go into the technical details. It's, uh, it's not a problem, but less relevant here. Okay, perfect. Thank you. The, uh, we got another question coming in from the audience. How do you represent GPS coordinates in your training data set? So you have GPS coordinates, by the way, Hen is here and, uh, and also Moran probably can also answer, but basically uh, you get these GPS coordinates uh, sample every 15 seconds uh, and you have information about the road itself, again, taken from uh, uh, you know, the geographic uh, uh, systems. And then you can actually extract out of those uh, GPS data many features that are related to the driving, like uh, acceleration between point to point, change of route. Uh, if you have um, you know, uh, a turn, how much uh, uh, you accelerate during this turn, uh, how many times you stop the car suddenly and so on. So all these GPS data are uh, mapped into uh, a wide range of uh, features. And these are the features that we are using to fingerprint the behavior of each driver. Okay, thank you. We've been getting questions in as you've been kind of answering them. We're trying to keep up as, as quick as we can. Can you talk a bit about the privacy implications that there might be in some of this, in some of this uh, research? Yes, yes, there are a lot of privacy implications. So the main idea was to only use GPS data uh, and to provide uh, something that is... Um, uh, generally, uh, on an you know, on an accumulated level, can be used by uh, by um, uh, the different uh, users and companies. So, for example, people that will be interested to uh, share this general uh, 
uh, information, not necessarily the location, but general information about their driving behavior could uh, enjoy or benefit from a better, you know, insurance plan. If they don't want to do it, of course, you 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 you, you won't do it. Uh, similarly, when you want to uh, identify the driver, it's not identifying the exact driver, but knowing that there are different drivers, and at that time there is a driver number one or two. Now, of course, you can actually think about uh, invading the privacy or way to invade the privacy when you know this information, and and this is why. Uh, we need regulation on, on top of those applications to assure that uh, it doesn't doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. Now, we're, we're running briefly out of time, but we do have time for one more question, which is, what are the challenges you see in these new applications generally? What, what challenges do you kind of foresee? Hmm. So, uh, the privacy issue is definitely uh, one of them. So, the last answer was very uh, much relevant to this. Uh, at the same time, um, um, when you talk about, uh, you know, automated vehicles, un unmanned vehicles, some of those the privacy issue will, will go away. Uh, as we move more and more to transportation, uh, you know, via um, different type of vehicles or drones and so on, uh, we will get uh, more challenges regarding uh, uh, the way to uh, model the data. But as long as we are, you know, focusing on uh, you know, main routes, uh, we see right now that uh, one of the first application is uh, using those unmanned vehicles that are already operating and quite successfully. So uh, uh, when you constrain the environment, those tools uh, that are supported right now could be very relevant. And some other challenges, I think that Yuval will definitely talk about it, uh, are arising and, and uh, uh, regarding the vehicle health and so on. And, and we probably will hear more about it uh, in the next lecture. Okay, thank you, Arad. That was uh, very interesting. I think we're approaching kind of the end of the time or the last few minutes. There might be time for one last question. Um, we're just checking one last moment. But in the meantime, we just wanted to kind of thank you for joining us and thank you for taking the time. Um, there is what time for one last question. It does have to be very, very quick. So I'm just going to write it down quickly now or, or say it quickly. Um, what are the other smart transportation applications that are expected in the future? And uh, we have kind of what, one minute left. Yeah, so, you know, uh, we see that as we provide better services, at least one area that we will see uh, emerging is anything that is related to those supply chain uh, uh, and uh, supporting those huge supply chains that became much more complex uh, even during Corona times, where people were using, you know, uh, much more uh, e-commerce system and digital systems. Uh, and you have to support uh, bringing all those. Uh, uh, goods to people at uh, certain places and it become extremely complicated and most of the uh, retail, for example, retail companies are now uh, addressing uh, high challenges and high costs due to this supply chain uh, complexity and we will see more and more smart application uh, you know, to use efficiently those vehicles and all those uh, uh, platforms that are moving in order to uh, support this uh, huge demand that is growing as you know as uh, you know the humankind is also growing uh, in terms of numbers and uh, we'll see a lot around this area